Thank you, Madam Chair. As Congress and the committee consider further action on the opioid crisis, I'd like to hear more about how federal funds have been used to make a difference. And based on the state submissions to the committee, which I mentioned in my opening, it appears several states have successfully used federal funds to respond to the crisis. So let me see how many I can get through here. Um, Mr. Kinsley, um, in your testimony, you noted that federal funding has enabled North Carolina to provide opiate use disorder treatment for 12,000 uninsured people. In the same testimony, you mentioned that, and I quote, since 2016, when the first of the major federal opioid grants was received, North Carolina saw its first decline in opiate overdose deaths in five years, decreasing 9% from 2017 to 18. So what factors do you attribute North Carolina's success in reducing overdose deaths and providing treatment to people who really need it? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> our focus has been 100% on medication-assisted treatment and uh, naloxone distribution in communities. I believe the naloxone distribution has been directly tied to the halt in deaths and the reduction in deaths that we have seen. Um, and after that, important programs that have linked individuals into care have been able to sustain that treatment and move individuals into recovery. Programs like peer support specialists, individuals who are in recovery themselves, we've placed them in emergency departments. Uh, we've worked with our local EMS providers to actually induct people into treatment so that if an individual who has an opioid reversal through an EMS visit uh, does not want to go to the hospital, they can actually begin their treatment then, and there's a follow-up uh, group of folks that come out and see those individuals after the fact. So it's been a lot of uh, very scaled, very strategic, focused interventions like that that have moved people into recovery and into the treatment pipeline that have been really important for us in North Carolina. Thanks. Let me go to Ms. Smith. I was encouraged to hear from your testimony that Pennsylvania has witnessed an 18% decrease in overdose deaths from 2017 to 18. So what factors do you attribute the reduction to and what are the few key areas that Pennsylvania should focus on to continue that trend if possible? Yeah, I think the keys for us is not all that different, actually. Um, a big focus on getting naloxone into communities, big focus on what we call a warm handoff process, which is getting overdose survivors from the hospital into treatment. Uh, we had a, a major issue in our hospitals and health systems with individuals overdosing and then being quickly released uh, back out onto the streets to overdose again, uh, repeated times. So I think those two things have been um, key for us. I think moving forward, what we'd like to do is spend a little bit more time and energy in the prevention space, trying to prevent before we get to worrying about needing naloxone and needing to activate the warm handoff process. Um, but our, our primary focus was really keeping people alive. Now that we've started to get a handle on that through naloxone and warm handoff and, and expanding treatment, now I think we can spend some time and energy really thinking about looking upstream and how do we improve our prevention efforts. Okay, thank you. Let me go to Dr. Alexander Scott with regard to Rhode Island's response to the committee. You noted that federal funds have enabled the state to improve data and surveillance, expand treatment capacity, and support innovations in delivery and treatment. Can you give us some specific examples of how federal funds have helped Rhode Island in those areas? There are multiple examples similar to what has been mentioned. Since you asked about data specifically, um, we use data in as real time as possible. We uh, obtain 48-hour reporting from our emergency departments for any suspected or um, actual overdose that has occurred. And on a weekly basis, we have a cross-agency team that assesses where overdoses are, um, GIS mapped across the state, and we release advisories to municipalities, key stakeholders, and providers um, to focus their areas when the overdose deaths have increased beyond a certain threshold. That allows us to drive out the um, resources and services that we have based on data in real time at the local level, which is one example. We continue to um, expand treatment and um, uh, recovery uh, services with the intention of meeting people where they are. So going out to um, reach folks through a mobile recovery and uh, treatment um, uh, vehicle is another example. Thank you. I don't know if I can get West Virginia in. Ms. Mullins noted that the state's treatment system has been completely overhauled in response to the opioid crisis, and much of the positive work today has occurred with her, been made possible as a direct result of the federal funds awarded 
since 2016. Do you want to give us briefly some examples of how federal funds have let West Virginia provide treatment and recovery services, particularly in rural and financially disadvantaged parts of the state? Yeah, specifically, really, in, it has given us the ability to expand our um, clinical providers who could provide MAT. We now have people in all of our 55 counties able to um, receive MAT, and then um, we have pre prescribers in, located physically in most counties. That's when the number one success we've really experienced with the federal funds. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair.